Hey guys, it's Intricate from AmigaLove.com. I wanted to give you an update on what I've been doing with the amazing Phoenix 1000, the Amiga Phoenix 1000 to be precise. Uh, in the last couple of weeks, I have been kind of going crazy trying to get the internal SCSI controller to work, to actually find hard drives. That's what, well, that was one of the major selling points of the Phoenix back in the day beyond being able to boot its own kickstart ROMs, it had the ability to have its own internal hard drive, which for 1991, that's the age of my particular motherboard, was a mind-blowing thing for an Amiga 1000. It just wasn't possible. This made it possible, but holy smoke, was it a difficult challenge to actually get it to work here in 2018? And what I wanna do is kind of walk you through my process, the things that I got to make it work, and talk a little bit about some of the uh, historical challenges of dealing with this ancient type of data and information today, but ultimately getting it to work, which is what this is all about. But first, a little demo of how sweet it is to have the Amiga 1000 hooked up to your internal hard drive. Now, check this out, okay? Here's my little custom LED that I installed down here. Here's the hard drive doing its work, the SCSI 2 SD card. It's already starting to load Workbench over there in the background, doing its checks that I created to make sure everything was working right. Because like I said, I did have some issues. And there it is, it's totally finished. Now this was a uh, 256 megabyte card. I made a 40 meg system uh, partition and a 200 meg uh, programs partition. That's really all I needed. Um, back in the day, that would have been somewhere between two and a half and five times the normal size of a hard drive back in 1991 when this motherboard was originally created. But holy smoke, so awesome. So the major project that I was working on here was really all about getting this internal SCSI connector, the controller, that's built right onto the motherboard working. And what I kind of knew from the beginning was I wasn't going to go mechanical this time around. The Amiga 1000's case is just really rather small and even though back in the early 90s when Andrew Wilson was selling these motherboards to people around the world, they did offer two uh, hard drive sizes, and they were quantum drives. They were big, fat suckers, but mainly they were sitting up here. You couldn't really mash them down into the case. You kind of had to just use your Amiga 1000 exposed, which, I'm sorry, that's just, that wasn't the way I wanted to go about it. I wanted to try and maintain the elegance of its original design, at least externally. And so I went with what's called the SCSI to SD card. You can find these online for about $60. Um, you have the option of buying the producer's uh, SD micro cards. I've done that in the past, but you can also pick up SD micro cards on Amazon for, for next to nothing. I decided to go with a 256 megabyte size, which is, I know that sounds rather small for today's standards, but back in the day, if I was to have gotten a hard drive from Andrew Wilson, I would have gotten something in the range of 50 to 100 megabytes. So this right here, this uh, SCSI to SD card with a 256 megabyte SD micro, that was somewhere between two and a half to five times the size of what I could have had back in 1991. And that little card cost me, or the little uh, SD micro cost me five bucks. Um, Again, so this was 65 bucks there. The first thing I had to do though, is I had to figure out how am I gonna give it a source of power because the, the original PSU for the Amiga 1000 only has one cable and it goes straight to the motherboard, that's it. There were no ex external devices for it to uh, attach to or internal devices for that matter. But luckily, one of the features of the uh, Phoenix 1000 is that it actually comes with um, more than one power port. So the default goes to a floppy and it's the small little four pin, right? Goes to your floppy to give it power. But then they left another one here 
for future use. So I had to get this kind of goofy looking small little four pin to the larger size um, to fit into the card and give it a source of power. Nice thing about this card also is that it's, it's, it's basically silent. There's no sound uh, being emitted. Very little heat, if any at all. And it's a really small power draw. So since I'm dealing with a really old PSU that I don't want to put any extra pressure on, this really was, in my opinion, hands down, the absolute best option for me personally. So started with that. Now, you're going to also see this uh, black cable plugging into that. That's a, another thing that I bought off of Amazon for a couple bucks. It was uh, basically I drilled a tiny little hole right here, about three millimeters right next to the uh, right next to the original uh, power LED and that allows me to see hard drive activity whenever it's uh, being accessed by the machine so those were the main things that I had to purchase for this the next stage of this was actually getting the darn thing to work I admit I was probably a little optimistic in buying all of these extra gadgets um, I probably should have just focused on this first before I dealt with the whole LED thing and making it work with the case and all of that. But at the time, I think I was feeling a little maybe overly optimistic. But in any case, the real challenge came down to the software and digging through the lack of information online of how to hook this thing up. And that's what I'm going to describe next. OK, guys, so now I'm going to walk you through the software that I had to accumulate over time across various sources um, to make this magic happen. Right, and so the first thing I needed, I knew I was gonna need was my Workbench 1.3 disc. Anybody that's got an Amiga 1000 has a Kickstart disc and they have a Workbench disc. I'm still in 1.3 land here in the Amiga 1000, which is, I feel like kind of where it should be most of the time, kind of going old school. Um, but I had that, I made a copy of it and set that aside. The next thing that I knew I was gonna need was um, the drivers, the SCSI drivers. And this is where things got really complicated and really confusing. And I am linking to an article down below this video if you're really into um, the history and the lack thereof. I'll explain a lot of this in more detail in that article. But basically, there are only a handful of sites that even talk about the, uh, the Phoenix 1000 beyond AmigaLove.com now. Uh, the main one is a1k.org, which has been around for a really long time. Uh, it's run by a very cool dude who I believe is based out of Germany, uh, who goes by the name of Apex. And it has some original documentation and schematics that Andrew Wilson uh, gave uh, a1k.org uh, many, many years ago. I think sometime in maybe 2000 and, 2006, if I remember correctly. In any case, around that same time frame, he also delivered to uh, the sysop of a1k.org a CD-ROM that included photos of most of the products that he'd ever created himself, um, schematics of the Phoenix and other uh, hardware that he had created um, back in Australia. And he, it also included uh, advertisements, copies of advertisements and brochures, pricing catalogs, all kinds of weird, interesting minutia that revolved around Andrew Wilson's business in the late 80s to, what, mid-2000s? Um, the aughts? In any case, he delivered that, and it included also uh, a more recent... Um, manual, things like that. Now the manual I have was version 1.2 and my manual didn't actually, well, I have an actual paper version. It doesn't actually have a chapter in it on hard drive installation. Back then, a lot of people I think just had Andrew Wilson's crew put the hard drives in for them and that was that. Um, but you had the option and the, if you had the ability and the motivation, you could put one in yourself. And there was a 1.3 version of the manual floating around that I was able to get a copy of that uh, does explain all of the hard drive installation stuff. 
That being said, it's referencing the original Phoenix discs, which to my knowledge no longer exist. And all of the uh, programs that it refers to, nowhere to be found. They just simply aren't out there anymore. That being said, on the a1k.org site, there are some disc images that were created at a, a future date. They don't actually have the software in them that I could determine to actually make your internal SCSI behave and actually make it recognized properly. It had a lot of stuff that sounded promising, but I could never get any of it to work. Um, finally, on Aminet, I found a SCSI driver called, I'm not quite sure what this means, uh, Pulled PB SCSI, PB meaning Phoenix board. So the Pulled PB SCSI was made by two gentlemen in 1997, one out of Austri Austria and another out of Canada, which is kind of amazing that they even wrote a driver for it that late compared to when these boards originally came out. Um, but it was supposed to try and improve the uh, internal SCSI driver situation for the Phoenix boards in general. And basically what you had to do is you had to take, you had to take programs off of the pulled PB SCSI and move them over into um, your expansions folder on your workbench disk. So you do that little move. You ensure that inside your own startup sequence that, you're, that you have the bind drivers command, right? Um, and then this was another piece that, that baffled me. You had to actually use HD install tools um, to set up your drives and if you actually got the drivers in the right place and you actually had them load properly during the startup sequence, HD install tools will indeed find your drive when it does its initial scan. And it did find my SCSI to SD card with the micro SD inside. And I was able to instantly then uh, partition, format, and all that fun stuff. I am going to do a video in the future of how to actually hook these little cards up into Amigas because they really are amazing little devices that when you think about it, they're relatively inexpensive for what they provide. Um, very, very powerful and kind of take us into the future uh, with some of these machines, especially the Amiga 1000 that just doesn't have any room. There's just no room to be found inside that case. It's tight and it can totally fit in there now with, uh, with no problem. So on the HD install tools though, you actually have to go to its icon, right? And go up into the workbench uh, pull down menu, go to info and change whatever tool type it's pointing to for its SCSI ID, uh, SCSI.device. It's not gonna be SCSI.device. It's not gonna be GVP SCSI.device. It actually is gonna be PB SCSI.device, which is not referenced on, in any documentation that I could find. I kind of just rolled the dice and was like, well, that wouldn't make sense to me um on my third attempt <laughs> and it actually worked that's when everything was finally started to be found and i was actually able to make the hard drive kick ass now the last piece of the puzzle was auto booting um, there actually are jumpers that are referenced inside the readme from pulled pb scuzzy as well as inside the the second version of the manual that i was able to find and I'm linking to on my site, so you can download it if you ever are fortunate enough to get one of these boards, or you're just curious and want to read through it because it's really interesting to you um, from a technical historical standpoint. But there is a jumper on the motherboard which can turn on auto booting or turn it off. And mine by default, ever since I had it, was turned off. Um, it's one of these kind of tricky situations where you've got three prongs, but you're told the jumper is two prongs. And you have to kind of guess, well, which ones do I use to, to do this or that? In any case, I did finally figure it out and was able to get the, uh, the auto booting working after I moved my customized workbench disk. I copied its entire contents over to the hard drive before I reset it and rebooted it and flipped the jumper. Whoop, Everything's working smooth as butter now. It's totally awesome. And as you saw in the demo, uh, what are we talking about? 20 something seconds to 
from the moment I touched the button to load it. That's pretty sweet, you guys. It's pretty awesome. And it's an Amiga 1000. So now I'm at the stage where I have to just kind of think about the fun stuff, finally, of what do I want to put on this thing and start doing and playing with and stop thinking about hardware for a little while because, you know, it can be all consuming to some degree. I'm kind of glad that it's almost behind me so I can actually set this desk up and let it be for a while what it was always meant to be, which is a kick-ass, really fun Amiga that can basically play virtually everything that was ever created for the Amiga ecosystem with some very rare exceptions and right off the hard drive. So of course, I'm not done. As soon as I finished recording that last video and started using the Phoenix, the auto boot stopped working. Every time I turned the machine on, it would just freeze. If I pulled the jumper off of auto boot for the motherboard, it would ask for the workbench uh, disk, load it up. Most of the time, the machine would just fire up like it was supposed to, and there were my two hard drives sitting on the desktop. Everything worked just great. The hard drive is amazing. It totally works the way it's supposed to, and the machine will load it normally if you use the disk to boot. But as soon as you put the jumper back on for auto boot, it'll fire up once. It'll load in 20 seconds. It's amazing. Then as soon as I turn the machine off, turn it back on again, it gets confused. So I've started talking to one of the guys over in Germany who's a part of the a1k.org site. He has some additional drivers, I think, that may or may not solve the problem. Worst case scenario, I just won't be able to auto boot um, off the hard drive, which kind of sucks. It sucks a lot. Um, but there's still a chance that there might be a, a solution. My hunch is that it has something to do with the EEPROM, uh, which continuously was receiving updated software back in the 90s for whatever reason. Um, I have a sneaking suspicion it has something to do with that and who knows if I'm going to go down the whole road of actually finding a more recent version that I can burn with an EEPROM burner, that kind of thing. If I can, great. If I can't, I'll just disable that jumper and uh, use it as a, as a regular old Amiga where you're not booting it off the hard drive, but I, or at least an Amiga 1000. But I still have access to those drives and I can still install stuff on those drives and launch them and have, have fun with it that way. But <clears throat> that's kind of where things got stuck. And so for at least now, I'm going to take a little break from the Phoenix. Um, I feel like I've gotten it really far and I'm really just like one tiny shred away from total glory. Um, but while I work with this other guy in offline, I kind of want to get back to actually using Amigas and not just playing with hardware all day long. That starts to get to be a bit of a grind, if you know what I mean. And so I think my next thing is going to be what I got going on over here. I set up my stock Amiga 1000 with a little bit of extra RAM on the side. No acceleration, no hard drives, not a zilch. But this next game I'm going to play, Will Harvey's The Immortal, which was uh, created and published by Electronic Arts, it actually does not like acceleration, um, and it really likes stock machines, and it actually looks a hell of a lot like Diablo. Quite frankly, this had to have be the it had to have inspired it to some degree. Um, it looks really amazing. I've never played it before, and I'm really looking forward to rolling up my sleeves and having some fun with that sucker. Back with my original stock Amiga 1000, and I'll let the Phoenix take a little break, and I'll take a little break. Um, and if I have any more information on that here in the near future, I'll definitely let you guys know. But until then, I think it's time to actually use the Amiga and have some fun with it. And until next time, guys, we'll see you. Have a good one.